Please help me welcome Russ Mitchell to the stage. Thank you very much, and Deborah, thank you once again for leaving those stories that are not in the bio out of that. I appreciate it. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here today. When I looked at all the incredibly impressive numbers that showed just how successful the College Now program has been, let me read some of these to you. Helping 20,000 students in a single school year, $2.3 million awarded in scholarships in the school year, a 91% freshman to sophomore retention rate, the national average is 58%. One figure jumped out at me about this day and told me once again how proud I am to be here with you today, and that is something that involves you. 373 scholarships awarded this year here in Cleveland. Fantastic. Give yourselves a round of applause. That is awesome. I hope that all of you are proud as well. This is, of course, is a remarkable achievement. I was lucky enough to attend school on a scholarship. I know that I appreciated it. And now that I am a parent of college-age kids, I really know how much my parents appreciated it. I owe my career to that scholarship, and I consider myself, once again, lucky then, and I consider myself lucky now. I am from a little town outside of St. Louis called Rock Hill, Missouri. And in my life, I've been fortunate. I've interviewed five presidents. I've traveled around the world. I've gone to three Super Bowls. I've worked with some of my broadcast idols, like Dan Rather, Bryant Gumbel, and Ed Bradley. You're going to hear me talk about them later on today. And I've been able to cover some of the biggest stories of the past 30 years. And I've been able to come and speak to folks like you, folks who have many of the same dreams that I had when I was your age, and that is to have a good life and work hard in my chosen profession. But as you know, this stuff does not come easy. And for the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about a couple things, like hard work, luck, and setbacks. A story I often tell, especially with, with when I'm talking to students and folks who are just uh, embarking on their careers, is my story of the first time I was in television. People ask me about that. What was it like the first time you were on TV? Well, I was uh, 19 years old. It was the University of Missouri, and it was one of those Today Show cut-ins. You've seen that. You watch the Today Show, the five-minute local cut-ins. It was the worst thing in the history of broadcasting. I mean, just horrific. But for whatever reason, when it was over, I thought it was pretty good. Don't ask me why, but I'm driving from the station to my parents' house that day. It's about 100 miles. And with each passing mile in my head, that news cut in got better and better and better. So by the time I walked into my parents' house, I'm like, dude, why are you even going back to school? You should just ride, drive right to New York. You can go to the network. You're that good. Well, for whatever reason, the atmospheric conditions were such that day that my parents could see that cut in at their home in St. Louis. And when I walked into my room, there was a note from my 13-year-old brother that put it all in perspective. We watched you this morning. You were real bad. <laughs> Setbacks. You're going to have them all your life. And that was my first one in this business. There are many more of those types of stories, and I'll share a few of them with you today. But one thing that has helped me move forward in those moments, no, no matter where I am, no matter what self-doubt or lack of confidence may come my way for whatever reason, is this, always have a thick skin. There are gonna be people in your life who are gonna tell you you can't do something, you're not cut out for this, you're not cut out for that, whatever. Just keep going. Stick to your guns, dream, listen, learn, but have a thick skin. Luck, a word you'll hear me use a lot today, I've discovered can come at you in a lot of ways. But one of the reasons that I consider myself lucky is that I am part of a generation who owes our professional experience to the men and women who paved the way for us to be here and have the jobs that we have today. You are beneficiaries of that as well. In my case, I'm a part of those efforts by so many to bring diversity to the world of journalism. My first taste of the business that I would eventually make a career in came during, as Deborah said, a journalism workshop at the University of Missouri for high school students, a workshop that came about because of calls for diversity, not only at the university, but in the business as well. As a bright-eyed 17-year-old student with a pretty impressive afro and some pretty cool bell-bottoms, some of you parents know what I'm talking about, I can tell you that my goal at that time was to become a network correspondent. And in that setting with those people, I was told over and over again, if that's what you want, it will happen. 
Now, you may have this experience as well. Before that, I would tell people my dreams, and a lot of times they would say, yeah, dude, right, that's, that's good. Just go with that. I remember meeting a, a prominent news person in St. Louis, someone I respected, who around that time flat out told me that I needed to set my sights lower. He said, although things were changing, it was very unlikely that anybody who looks like me would ever get a chance to cover stories that could lead them to a big market or perhaps a network. But I always remembered what my professors at the university would tell me, and that would keep me going. I left that workshop with a somewhat magical, crazy determination that is a part of the joy of being your age. Uh, my goal at that point was to get a job at a television station in St. Louis, not four years down the road, but right away. Went knocking on doors to every station, and I was shocked but there was no big demand for a 17-year-old who just finished his junior year of high school. I couldn't believe that. So one day, out of the blue, I get a call from my cousin who tells me about a job at the ABC station in town. You have to keep this in mind. I'm 17 years old. I know no better. I said to my cousin, it is, a re is it a reporter's job? She said, no. Um, producer's job? No. Uh, editor's job? No. What is it? She said, you would be answering the telephone. I went, oh, okay. So I took that job. I did that job for a year, my senior year of high school, and I learned more about the business of television in that year than I could ever learn in a textbook. It was a fantastic year, and I met a lot of people who would become mentors and colleagues down the road. Once again, luck had a huge hand in that, and the moral of that story is you're going to meet people as you go along. Get their names, get their phone numbers, get their email addresses, stay in touch with them because you will discover it is a very small world. So after high school, I went to the University of Missouri, a, a place that was having a tremendous struggle with diversity at the time. This was the late 70s. And in the fall of my freshman year, there were 25,000 students at the school and 500 people of color. The flunk out rate at that time was something like 88%. Of the 110 African-American freshmen who would enter school that year, 90 of them would flunk out or leave by the end of the year. How obvious was it? I was in a lecture class. Imagine this room only twice as big. This was a room you went to three days a week, and you'd go to labs other days of the week. So there's all these people in the room. You know, you can, don't do this, kids, but those kind of classes, people are, have been known to skip, okay? So I skipped one, all right? I admit it now, all these years later. Well, I skipped a class on Tuesday, and on Thursday I came back, and I'm thinking, you know, nobody's gonna know. The professor stops me and says, where were you on Tuesday? I said, how did you know I went? Oh, I was the only person who looked like me in the classroom. Now I got it. Some of you are going to find yourselves in that position when you go to school as well. My advice there is to make friends with good people, work hard, have fun. And thanks to all those people in my life, including my parents, I was able to graduate from the University of Missouri School of Journalism in four years. As Deborah said, my first job was in Kansas City, and, and with that came the agony and the ecstasy of that first job. There were moments that I thought, wow, this is really cool. I really get to do this. And other moments, I thought I was going to be fired. I don't know what it is about me and morning cut-ins, but the first one I did with that station, uh, it was bad as well. Uh, I went to the newsroom when it was over, and the news director was on the phone, apparently with a viewer. I was filling in for somebody doing the cut-ins that day. And all I could hear was the news director's you know, voice on the phone. I couldn't hear the other person. But the news director said on the phone, oh, don't worry, she'll be back tomorrow. He was just filling in. <sighs> OK. There were moments like that, the time I did sports there, and I didn't know any of the players' names. You know, There was all sorts of times I thought I was going to get fired. But someone saw something in me, and in six months, I was offered a job as a reporter at a station in Dallas, which at the time was the eighth largest market in the country. I was 23 years old and honestly out of my league, but I was fortunate enough to be taken in by a group there called the National Association of Black Journalists, and I, I needed a support group there. The station was a powerhouse. Some of the best reporters in the country worked there at the time, including Scott Pelley, who's now the anchor of the CBS Evening News. Again, 23 years old, and in a place like that, there are things that are going to rock your confidence. And one of the first things I remember is the time they sent me out to do my first live shot. And it was a plane crash, and right before the live shot, a more seasoned reporter tapped me on the shoulder. This may have been five minutes beforehand. And he said, uh, Russ, I hate to tell you this, but Marty, who was our boss, wants me to do the live shot. 
and I was devastated. This was before cell phones or anything like that, and he was the person to tell me, and it was clear that he was very embarrassed by it. Well, 23 years old, not knowing any better, I went into the news director's office the next day and reamed him the riot act. I think he looked at me like, this boy's crazy. <laughs> Who is he to be telling me what's going on, what I should do in my newsroom? Uh, having, looking back on it, I probably would have handled things differently, but I tell you what, I was never pulled off another live shot, and in time I got to be known as Mr. Live Shot at WFAA. At this point, I was in a position to give back, and as Deborah said, every year I go back to the workshop that I attended back in the late 70s at the University of Missouri. It was and continues to be a great feeling. In fact, I've been going back there for so long that some of my students are now prominent doctors and prominent lawyers. Uh, one student in particular was this really funny kid from suburban St. Louis. Uh, nice guy, didn't think, you know, wow, he had a great career ahead of him. His name was Cedric Kyles. You know him as Cedric the Entertainer. Uh, that's how long I've been going back to this, <laughs> this workshop. <laughs> At this time in my career, I got a job offered to work in my hometown of St. Louis, that strange combination of hard work, timing, and luck. And get this, the station offering me the job was the same station where I was a switchboard operator seven years earlier. It felt like I was coming full circle, an incredible feeling. Over the next few years, I got nibbles from the network but those conversations usually ended with me being told my writing needed more work, which was true. I needed to have better stories under my belt, which was also true. And something I wish people would tell me today, and that was, you look too young. Uh, trust me, uh, don't be offended when somebody tells you you look real young, because eventually you won't hear that anymore. One day, I got a call from CBS News in New York asking if I'd be interested in a job as anchor of an overnight news show up to the minute. I think I said yes before they even finished their sales pitch to me. If you are lucky, there will be times in your life when you truly feel you are on top of the world. And on my first day on the job at CBS News in 1992, that was me. Those years of being told I couldn't do it, it wasn't going to happen, suddenly fade away. But I also knew and continued to know that I was getting the job, again, thanks in large part to a lot of people who fought hard and people who looked after me, people who wanted to know that people like me would have a chance to work in television newsrooms. I thought of a guy named the late Harold Dow, who was the first African American to anchor an overnight news show at CBS. Bryant Gumbel, who I mentioned earlier, who some people in this room remember, defied critics who said America was not ready to wake up to a black morning show host. Then he decided to take the Today Show to number one. Ed Bradley, the consummate journalist who set the gold standard at CBS News for more than three decades. Whoever you are, whatever your background, I encourage you to honor your past and remember a lot of people worked very hard to get you where you are, including where you are today. On that note, I want to say something that Lee said as well. Again, as a parent, I can certainly appreciate this. Can we have another round of applause for the parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, guardians, all those people who brought you to this place today? You cannot be applauded enough as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> My late mother would be very proud of you and proud of the fact that I've been invited here today to speak to you by college now. She was a third grade teacher for 30 years. Her mother was a teacher, her father a principal. He went to Harvard and graduated in 1905. My mother and my grandmother went to Howard. Now they wanted me to apply to Howard and I did and I'm still waiting to hear from them. Uh, I'm sure that my acceptance letter was lost in the mail 35 years ago but, but you know, I, I, I'm waiting. I'm, I'm confident it's gonna come at any moment now. But my point is I've been taught from day one almost the importance of education, something that you know as well. You've all accomplished a lot so far, and no one can ever take that away from you. Your job now is to take that to the next step, and you'll discover that never stops in life. You'll want to always keep challenging yourself. Keep pushing. Keep seeing if you can do things better, and you never know where life is going to take you. Two years ago, when I was looking to leave what had become a very rewarding but crazy network life, I decided I wanted to go back to local TV, but I said to myself, I'm not going to do it if I don't find a great city with a great station and a place where I can help make a difference. I had been to Cleveland several times uh, in my role as a correspondent for CBS News for Stories, so I was familiar with the area. But once I really got to know the city 
And once I had my job interview with Channel 3 and, and Rita Andelson, who is the board member of college now, I knew it was a slam dunk. And I can tell you, 18 months here, I am so happy to be a Clevelander. It's a wonderful place. Thank you. I've even figured out the east side, west side thing now after all this time. You never know where life is going to take you. Always remember that. My father once told me that everything happens for a reason. And as we approach Father's Day, I think my father, God rest his soul, was right. Now, things will happen. It may not seem that everything happens for a reason at the time, but in my experience, eventually the puzzle pieces come together and you say, oh, wow, now I see. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's not so good. Earlier, I spoke to you about setbacks, disappointments, and the importance of luck, good timing, being in the right place at the right time, meeting people who believe in you, having the ball bounce your way. But even with all the luck in the world, at the end of the day, it all becomes about you and what you bring to the table. And there lies the importance of something I know that you all know about, and that is working hard. There will be people you will meet along the way who are more talented than you. Perhaps they come from more privileged backgrounds. They seem to have everything going for them that you feel you don't. You will not be able to control that. What you can control is what you do, and you can be the hardest working person in the room. When the study session is over, you go home and keep on studying. If you don't understand something, call your professor. If the job is for eight hours, don't be afraid to stay nine hours. Again, these are things that you can control. Part of working hard, part of being professional, professional, whether you're in school, on the job, or at a job interview, is being who you are and respecting people. I'm going to tell you a story about a guy who came to Channel 3 a few months ago to apply for a job as a reporter. Let's, uh, let's call him Doofus. Uh, he came from Birmingham, no, excuse me, Biloxi. He was in for a job interview for a morning reporter job. So he was told, okay, doofus, you come in at 6 o'clock in the morning because we want you to see how the morning show operates. Doofus, who the station had flown to town and put him up in a hotel and gave him a really nice meal that night, said, okay, I'll be there. At 5.45 the next morning, doofus calls the news director and says, you know, I've kind of overslept. I'm not going to make it. The news director says, OK, we'll be there at 6.30. Doofus says, yes, OK. Doofus doesn't show up at 6.30. Doofus doesn't show up at 7. Doofus doesn't show up at 8. Doofus shows up at 8.30. He walks in the station and says, I overslept. He was promptly put in a plane and told to go back home. Seems simple, unprofessional. Another story. A few years ago, I'm doing a story about FedEx in Memphis. At the time, FedEx was named the best company in the, in the world to work for. Gentleman was telling me a story about a man who applied for a job there. This is before people were using fax machines as they do now. The potential job applicant was told by an executive at FedEx, overnight me your resume the next day. Overnight me your resume so I'll have it tomorrow. So the next day, the guy's resume shows up, overnighted, not by FedEx, but by DHL. <laughs> he didn't get the job either. One other thing that someone once told me in this arena of hard work was always be true to yourself. Your education, no one can take that away from you. As I said, what you've accomplished so far is yours. You own that. But chances are someday you're going to work for somebody. You're going to be an employee. My advice to you is work hard. Be proud of what you do. Always do your best. But Never try to get too much of your self-worth from something that someone can take away from you. I've seen people at the top of their respective professions wrap up their entire notion of who they are in a job. And when that job went away, I've watched them crumble because they forgot what brought them there. Work hard. Do your best. Enjoy your family. Have good friends. Get a dog. Own your accomplishments and be true to yourself. Again, this is a wonderful day for you, and you are truly blessed. I can't say enough about the great work that the folks at college now do, and someday you'll be in a position to give back. 
there are people in this room, many people in this room, who are pulling for you, who want the best for you in life, and want to see you take this opportunity that you've earned and run with it hard. I wish you many, many top-of-the-world moments in your life. Smile, be happy, celebrate, and I hope you see this day and this opportunity as one of those top-of-the-world moments. I'm going to leave you now with the elegant words of my grandfather, who said this to me when I went off to college. Now, go kick some butt. Thank you very much. <laughs>